Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jude Richter. I'm the social media manager here at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We're very excited today to bring you our first ever webcast of a Curator's Corner program. Our curator, Kira Schuster, will be talking today about artifacts and other objects that document the experiences of American prisoners of war that were held at a concentration camp called Berga. I think it's very appropriate we do this program today, the day after Memorial Day. And without, I'll, before I introduce, let bring Kira to the stage, I just wanna ask people who are watching us on the live stream to tweet their questions during the program at us and we'll get as many of them as we can to Kira before the end of the program. Our handle is at, you at excuse me, it's at Holocaust Museum. So tweet us your questions at Holocaust Museum. And now Kira's gonna take the stage. Good afternoon. My name is Kira Schuster, and I am one of the curators in the Art and Artifact Department here at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. Uh, thank you all for joining us today in person as well as online. As one of the museum curators, I am constantly searching for new additions and acquisitions for the museum's permanent collection. While reading through the news online one morning in 2008, I, read, I ran across a story about an American uh, World War II prisoner of war who had survived the Berga concentration camp. This was exceptional to me because since 2005, I had been conducting my own research on American experiences during the Holocaust, and also because we had no original artifacts from the Berga camp currently in our collection. I strongly believe that our museum as an American institution has the responsibility to collect and to catalog American stories from the Holocaust. And I'm excited to announce that we are actually working on a project and an exhibition that'll be opening in a few years that will tell uh, the American uh, perspective of the Holocaust. So when most people think about Americans in the Holocaust, we tend to think of the heroes, the liberators, the war crimes investigators, the lawyers who prosecuted the war crimes trials. And very few people think of Americans also as having been victims of the Holocaust. This afternoon, I'm gonna share with you the story of 350 American soldiers who found themselves caught up within the web of the Holocaust. Now, many of these GIs were initially recruited under the US Army's specialized training program, which was known as the ASTP. Established in 1942, the ASTP was the largest educational program in our nation's history, and it sent more than 200,000 men to college. Most of these men expected to become officers or be assigned to technical units, but all of that changed over the course of the war. Due to pressure for replacements in Europe, many of the men in this program ended up in the infantry and sent overseas to participate in the Battle of the Bulge. The three men that you see here, uh, Anthony Acevedo, Bernard Jack Vogel, and Sidney Goodman, all came from very different backgrounds. The military trained them and prepared them for battle, but could never prepare them for what would ultimately face them. The Battle of the Bulge began on December 16, 1944, and was one of the costliest battles for US troops during World War II. An official report by the United States Department of the Army listed over 108,000 casualties, which included 19,000 killed, 62,000 wounded, and 26,000 captured or missing in action. Many of the men were captured after they found their units surrounded by German troops, or they were forced to surrender after they were the only members of their unit to survive heavy gunfire and surprise attacks. Some of the Americans were interrogated upon arrest uh, by their captors, and some of the soldiers already began to be concerned for their own welfare because they were Jewish. The American troops were forced to march through ice and snow uh, for about up to a week at a time. Often they were asked to remove their boots so that they would not escape. And the new prisoners of war were arrived at the town of Gerolstein, Lex Luxembourg, where they were loaded onto dirty, crowded, cramped boxcars, jostling and arguing with each other to get better positions in the cramped car. Very little food or water was provided to them, and certainly there was no medical attention that was provided to the wounded. 
Finally, the men arrived at Stalag 9B, which was located in Bad Orb, Germany. And this is a large prisoner of war camp about 20 miles from Frankfurt. In this image, you can see the diary that Jewish American soldier Sidney Goodman began to keep immediately after his capture. All Goodman had to write on were the 36 photographs that his wife Grace had sent him from back home in Michigan. And here's his baby daughter, Karen. The images were of happier times and fond memories friends and family, summers at the beach, baby Karen, and certainly this was a very stark contrast to his current surroundings. Now, most of the men were captured in late December 1944, just before Christmas. However, their families would not be notified for at least another four weeks later. Here you can see the telegram that Grace Goodman received from the War Department about a month after Sydney had been captured, and it notified them only that Sydney was officially listed as missing in action. It would not be for another four weeks until Grace Goodman would then receive official notification that her husband had been captured as a prisoner of war. And of course, thousands of other families across the United States were receiving the same news about their loved ones as well. The first group of prisoners arrived at Stalag 9B on December 26, 1944. And you'll hear as I give this presentation, I'm repeating a lot of the dates because I think it's important for you to understand where we are within the larger timeline of World War II. Uh, the numbers of POWs steadily increased after the first wave of arrivals, and conditions were not ideal at the camp. Uh, men were forced to eat snow to supplement the rations that they were given. And shortly after New Year's, all of the Americans were asked to identify themselves by name, rank, serial number, and religion. Now, religion was not something that the POWs were supposed to be asked. And many of the American GIs initially resisted providing this information to the Germans. Some of the Jewish soldiers actually tossed their dog tags aside or buried them in the snow uh, because, as you can see here, the American dog tags identify the, their religion. And if you looked at the more circular ones on the right side, right, my right, uh, your left, uh, you see Norman Fellman's dog tags, and in the lower right corner is a little H, which stands for Hebrew. Now, other GIs had C for Catholic or P for Protestant and so on. And this was standard information that the US military put on their dog tags. Uh, and I get asked all the time, why would they intentionally send especially Jewish GIs into battle into Nazi Germany, knowing at this point what was happening? And the reason why they included this information is because if the soldier um, should be unable to speak for himself if he's mortally wounded or killed in combat, um, that they could still respect the religious preferences of the soldier uh, if he could not speak for himself or his uh, comrades did not know. So some of the Jewish soldiers were very proud of their heritage. They were not going to try to hide it or deny it. Um, they didn't really care what the Germans did to them. Uh, some of the men uh, told me they were never even asked what their religion was at all. And once all of the men were registered, they were assigned a POW number and issued a second set of dog tags, which is the POW tag, which is the square one on my left, your right. And uh, this indicated the camp number, so you can see the IXB on top and their prisoner number, uh, the number underneath it. In late January 1945, the Germans went through the troops and separated out all of the Jewish American soldiers, which at that point numbered about 70 or 80 men and they placed them in separate barracks. Now, Sidney Goodman wrote in his diary at the time that some of the non-Jewish soldiers thought that this was unfair and that the Jewish soldiers were now receiving preferential treatment. This, of course, was not true because treatment, treatment remained equally awful for all of the soldiers. Somewhere, and we don't know where exactly, orders had come down that 350 prisoners of war were now needed for forced labor. On February 8, 1945, all of the Americans were called out of their barracks and again ordered that all of the Jewish American soldiers identify themselves. Myron Swack from Ohio went ahead and identified himself as Jewish. And years later, he recalled of that moment, I was born a Jew, I might as well die a Jew. The Germans then went through and pulled, went through the lines and pulled out all of the men that they felt looked Jewish or who had Jewish sounding names. Ed Slotkin, who was originally from the Bronx, was told by one of the guys in his unit not to raise his hand. Don't identify yourself. And Ed had always thought that this other soldier was anti-Semitic. And now this GI was telling him, 
don't raise your hand. We'll protect you. We'll cover for you. We've got your back. But Ed, in his own words, and I apologize for the slightly salty language, he said, and what a schmuck I was. I raised my hand, and he identified himself as Jewish, and you can actually see here that his name is number one on the list. The Germans then went through and pulled out all the Catholic soldiers, along with anyone that they identified as undesirable or having been a troublemaker. And this included German-American atheist Johann Kasten from Hawaii, who had been serving as their man of confidence. And so he was the translator between the Germans and the Americans. Um, he represented the American GIs. Uh, they also pulled Mexican-American Catholic GI uh, Anthony, uh, known as Tony Acevedo. And Tony had already been interrogated by the Germans for an incident that had occurred back in his hometown of Durango, Mexico, earlier during the war. Once the Germans had identified their 350 and filled their roster, the troops were again marched back to the train station where they were once again loaded onto boxcars and had a six day journey with no additional food or water. And actually Tony told me the story of they would fight to push their hands through the windows of the boxcar to grab the icicles that were forming off the windows just so they had something. And the train finally arrived in the small town of Berga under Elster where they were marched to a subcamp of the infamous Buchenwald concentration camp. The Americans arrived at the Berga camp on February 13, 1945. And as they marched from the train station to the camp, the American POWs passed political prisoners wearing striped prisoner uniforms. Uh, those prisoners were held in a camp called Berga I, and the Americans were placed in a separate camp known as Berga II. Of the 350 men, they were again all interrogated. They were placed into lice-covered barracks, one of which you see here. And the men received, again, little to no food and assigned to, to a bunk. The majority of the soldiers were assigned to a forced labor detail with the pol political prisoners of Berga I, and they had to dig and excavate tunnels in 12-hour shifts. They didn't know it at the time, but the plan was that the tunnels would ultimately all converge to a single point where the Germans were going to build or hoped to build a synthetic underground fuel factory. The work was hard, dirty, and exhausting. Um, their primary duties were to make the charges, blast out the rock and rubble, haul out the rubble. Um, they were inhaling all this dust and rock. They were exhausted from having to carry the heavy loads. And often, uh, when they could, the Americans would have commit small acts of sabotage by not setting the charges correctly or tipping over the carts of rubble too soon to block the tracks. And uh, many times, often, the GIs were beaten and abused by the German captors. Now, the Americans were working side by side with the political prisoners of Berga I, but the two groups actually did not communicate very frequently. Uh, the political prisoners were, were from a wide variety of different countries, some of whom were also Jewish, uh, but they were very confused as to why the Americans were actually there. At first, when they saw them arriving, they thought they were being liberated, um, and it became quite clear once they saw them working in the tunnels that this was not the case. Um, the Americans on their side were very dubious to communicate with the political prisoners, because if these Europeans could speak English, then how did, how did they know that they weren't spying on them for the Germans? So while there was some communication between the two groups, it was quite infrequent. The men who were army medics uh, were not required to work in the tunnels, but instead were in charge of picking up the daily food rations from the Berga I camp. And they also had to walk across these floating uh, bridges across the Elster River uh, to retrieve any of their fellow soldiers who had fallen out or had died. Uh, they would care for their comrades as best they could. Uh, they had little to no medical supplies. In fact, Tony Acevedo told me sometimes the only thing, oftentimes the only thing he could give a soldier who was sick or dying was just water. That was all they had. And uh, this Red Cross armband was actually issued to and worn by Tony Acevedo. And the signatures that hopefully you can see are all the signatures of the other medics who were with him in Berga. As prisoners of war, the men were all entitled to receive care packages from the International Red Cross. However, at Berga, these packages were only ever um, distributed once. They were withheld from the Americans. And there's um, a photo taken by the war crimes investigators that shows an open barrack door, and it's literally floor to ceiling care packages that were never delivered. Uh, these packages contained food, cigarettes, some supplies, books, uh, and a few of them actually also contained journals. Tony Acevedo was lucky enough to receive two journals. 
One he gave to another soldier, Stephen Schweitzer, and the other he kept for himself. And this was a fact that Tony kept hidden from the German guards. Tony became concerned that nobody would know that they were there. Uh, while their families at this point certainly had been notified that they were missing in action, and hopefully at this point they knew they were prisoners of war, um, certainly they did not know that they had been sent to the Berga camp. So in his new journal, which you can see the cover in the title page here, Tony began to detail their daily life in the camp. He included many rumors about what they were hearing about the war. Uh, he reminisced about his family back home in Mexico. He details um, thinking of Easter and even Passover for his Jewish comrades. But he also began keeping lists of the men that the medics attended to and provided medical care. And then he began keeping a second list in the back of his journal that listed the names and the prisoner numbers of the men who died or who had been executed. And here is one of the pages from that list. And you see he numbers it one through, this happens to go through 84, uh, their POW number, their last name, their diagnosis, and then in the final column is the date that the GI died. When I asked Tony why did he feel compelled to keep this information, because it was certainly dangerous enough for him to be keeping a journal, let alone to be documenting uh, the deaths of these other GIs in the camp. I mean, he could have been at risk for severe punishment or even worse, death if he had been caught. And he told me, and I quote, that it was his moral obligation to do so. Because as far as they knew, nobody knew that they were there. And by keeping this diary and recording these lists, at least there was a written record that these men had been there. Now, Sidney Goodman also continued to write in his diary, uh, but he was fast running out of space. This is photo number 34 out of 36. And as a side note, I just want to add the water damage did occur after the war, not during the war. So we actually do have a transcript of the complete text of the original diary. And Goodman also recorded when he could the names of GIs who had died. He did note when men were able to successfully escape from the camp, because that did happen, and what life was like working in the tunnels, and then when they weren't in the tunnels, what life was like back at the camp. On April 3rd, 1945, the Germans evacuated the camp and all of the remaining Americans were sent on a forced march, what we refer to as a death march, south towards Czechoslovakia uh, in order to stay ahead of the allies who were approaching. And at this point, there were about 280 Americans who remained in the camp. Again, a number had died and then you also had men who had escaped. And the medics were responsible for pulling a large cart that the men who were too sick or feeble uh, or unable to physically walk anymore had to go on. And Norman Fellman told me the absolute last place you wanted to be was at the bottom of the pile on the cart. That was a f worse than actually having to be on the cart. Um, many more men died on the death march and the death march lasted two and a half weeks. On the night of April 22nd, 1945, the remaining GIs were billeted for in a barn overnight. The POWs knew that the US Army was getting closer because they could hear the American machine gun fire getting louder and louder, and they could differentiate between the sound of the American weapons and the German weapons. So the, the POWs decided they were gonna stage a sit-in, for lack of a better term, and they were not gonna get up when ordered to do so the next morning. When the German guards realized what was happening the following morning, they came into the barn, they yelled, Rouse, Rouse, get up, get up, and all the GIs just stayed still. Nobody got up. And when the guards realized that really the tide was now turning against them, they fled, leaving the GIs alone. The POWs opened the barn doors and looked out upon the road. There was a field between them and the road, and they saw a large tank coming around the corner and up the road. And this tank had a big white American star on the side of it. And the men threw open the barn door and those who could just ran like crazy people across the field towards the tank. When they got to the road, one of the GIs um, asked where they were from because the GIs that found them were very confused. I mean, Ed Slotkin said, I went running across that field, which was probably the dumbest thing that I could do towards this tank with my hands up in the air. And they stopped and they looked at these disgustingly dirty, starving, emaciated, lice-ridden men. And they looked like what you, you, know, you think of when you see concentration camp visitors, uh, prisoners. In fact, here you see some of the men after they were liberated. You see how emaciated they are. 
And one of the GIs on the tank said, who, who are you? And Ed replied and identified the group, we're GIs, we're prisoners of war. And with that, they were free. And Norman Fellman said, seeing those tanks come around the bend in the road was, he described it, quote, it was the best thing I had ever seen. They were GIs and we were free. And the men had been liberated by members of the 11th Armored Division of the US Army. So it's estimated that between 165 and 180 of the original 350 Americans survived Burga, which is only about half the group. Uh, the reason why we don't have an exact number, again, is because some of the men escaped. Some of the men who died on the death march were not um, identified because men were dying so quickly in those final days that Tony could not keep up in his diary the names of everyone. Um, Ed Slotkin told me one of his biggest regrets during the experience was there was a, a GI who died on the side of the road during the death march and they stopped to bury him. And he said, I regret not taking his dog tags because now we couldn't tell his family that he had died and where to find him. But I thought if I took the dog tags, then when they found the body, they wouldn't know he was one of us either. So he, he couldn't have it both ways, uh, but he always regretted not remembering who that GI was. So the men um, were picked up. They were sent to a field hospital. They were stripped of their lice covered uniforms and given food and medical treatment. And from there, they were sent to a recuperation center, which is the image that you see here. And all of the men in this photograph are survivors of Burga. Unfortunately, their story does not end there, although one would hope it would. Um, while they were recuperating, some of the Burga survivors were asked by the U.S. Army to sign a document that the survivors understood to mean that they would never, ever publicly talk about what happened to them uh, under punishment of disciplinary action. And here you see the form that some of them are asked to sign. Now, we now know that this is a standard military form that the military actually still uses a version of today which protects men and women who are still in a field or still being held as prisoners of war by asking those who have um, returned to protect any escape or evasion techniques, communication techniques, military maneuvers, and so on. And you need to remember that the war in the Pacific is still actively going on after these men were liberated. So though many of those POWs in the Pacific had not yet been freed. In the years that followed though, the Burga survivors who signed this form took it to heart. And while their families certainly knew that they had been captured as prisoners of war, not all of the men shared the full details of their experience. In fact, it would be decades before some of them ever spoke out in great detail about what happened to them. And a few years ago, I was interviewing one of the Burga men, and we were talking for hours, I mean, literally hours, about what happened to him, all through dinner, all after dinner. This man's poor wife, God bless, she fell asleep at the table, and I felt awful about it. It was that late, right? And so when I was leaving their home, I was like, I, I need to go home. It's been a long day. And I said to her, thank you so much for opening your home to me and for listening to us talk for hours about your husband's experiences. And she said, no, 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 I need to thank you. And I said, why? What did I do? You know? And she said, because most of what he told you tonight, I have never heard before. And this was a couple that had been married for about 50 years at this point. She never knew. He never talked about it. And he was finally opening up about it. Now, Charles Vogel was the uncle of Bernard Jack Vogel, who you saw at the beginning. Jack did not survive. He actually died during the death march in Tony Acevedo's arms. And Charles was so devastated by the death of his nephew that he started his own investigation into the crimes that happened against the Americans at Burga. Charles himself was a World War I veteran. He was president of the Jewish War Veterans Association in New York. Uh, he was a prominent attorney. He had a lot of connections in the War Department. And so he used all of his connections to find out what happened. He wrote to a lot of POWs who were at 9B. He wrote to as many Burka survivors as he could find. And he asked them these basic questions. Who do you remember being with you? Do you remember any names of any of the German guards? Do you have details about what happened to you while you were there? And uh, here's an example. What you see here is just one of those questionnaires that he had sent out. And he was gathering all of this evidence so it could be presented uh, as evidence at the war crimes trials of the two Germans, two German officers who had been captured and were being put on trial for the crimes of the GIs at Berga. And their names were Captain Ludwig Mertz and Sergeant Erwin Metz. And their names are very similar, so it does get a little confusing. On September 3rd, 1946, the trial of Mertz and Metz finally began as part of the Dachau war crimes trials, the military trials that were being held at the former Dachau concentration camp. 
and none of the surviving POWs were invited back to testify uh, at the trial. Despite Charles Vogel's best efforts, he even offered to pay for them to come on his own dime, but only 12 of their affidavits were presented as evidence. Uh, and he had gathered more than 70, I believe. The military tribunal lasted for six weeks and ended with the sentence of death by hanging for both men. Appeals, of course, were submitted. Their sentences were both later commuted in 1948 to 20 years for Metz and five years for Mertz. But it, within three years of that, uh, Ludwig Mertz was set free and Erwin Metz would be released from prison in 1957 with sentence of time served. And Charles Vogel continued to rally for the justice uh, against, uh, of, for the Americans and the crimes that had happened against them. He helped found the Burga Survivors Organization and amassed a large personal collection of documents and correspondence relating to his research. Now, I'm proud to say that through my work and research here at the Holocaust Museum, uh, we have now acquired multiple collections of original materials that document the American POWs at Burga, and we're always looking to acquire more. And in fact, we currently have artifacts from Berga on display upstairs in our permanent exhibition. You can find it on the third floor of our exhibit within the barracks section. And while we had information about Berga in the museum, we had oral testimonies, we had a few memoirs that had been written, but we didn't have any original materials. And in 2010, Tony Acevedo was the first Berga survivor to donate his diary and his armband and a cross and prayer book and family photos and other items he had with him. And the publicity from his donation led to the Vogel family donating Charles Vogel's extensive collection of materials. And it's kind of snowballed in a wonderful way. It has snowballed since then. So all of these new collections, when they come in, I personally digitize all of them. We catalog them. We do detailed inventories because we never know when the next family is going to come looking for information. One afternoon, we randomly had a gentleman walk into the museum's registry of uh, Holocaust survivors and victims to our resource center on the second floor here at the museum. And he, they all start the same way. They start, I have the craziest story. My grandfather uh, was an American citizen, but he was also in a concentration camp, but he was also a soldier. And uh, the gentleman at the desk just looked at him and said, you need to talk to Kira. And he said, What's Kira? I don't understand this. They go, just go to the fifth floor, go talk to Kira. So he came upstairs, and as soon as he mentioned Berga, I said to him, what's your grandfather's name? And he told me, and I was immediately able to pull up all of this information, because he'd filled out a questionnaire in the Vogel collection, and I found his name on the roster of 350 that I scanned when I found it at the National Archives. And he was so overwhelmed, because for the first time ever, he finally had physical evidence of what happened to his grandfather. He was the only grandchild his grandfather had ever spoken to about. He was maybe 15 when he initially heard these stories. But who would think that American POWs would be in a concentration camp? And now he had the solid evidence to take back to his family. And I've been very lucky uh, that I've been able to also help other Berga families as well from the collections that we've received. Another result from the publicity of Tony donating his collection and speaking out so publicly was that in the summer of 2009, for the first time ever, the U.S. Army finally publicly acknowledged what happened to the 350 GIs of Berga. And while they had always acknowledged that these gentlemen were prisoners of war, that was never in question, they had never publicly acknowledged that they were held in a concentration camp until that summer. And these men finally received the full military honors that had not yet been accorded to them. And in addition, uh, National Geographic had filmed and picked up the story. We did a documentary together which I was very excited to be a part of. Charles Guggenheim also had previously filmed a documentary. So finally, we're getting this information out there about what had happened to them. And of course, the most extraordinary part of this for me out of all of this is getting to know these amazing men and their families. And uh, we are truly a mutual admiration society. So what can you do to help us further this project? Um, as I said, through our research and our acquisitions, uh, the museum is able to reunite people with their own history. And we can educate others about these lesser known stories of the Holocaust. Uh, we continue to collect new materials for our permanent collection. As I mentioned, we're always looking for more. Uh, and we have a very broad collecting scope. And we're currently actively seeking new materials that relate to our upcoming exhibition on Americans in the Holocaust. So certainly, if you, your family, your next door neighbor, your grandmother's best friend's dog walker, whoever it is, <laughs> I, I just met randomly, I, I just met somebody sitting next to me on the plane. We sat next to each other for two hours before his wife asked where I worked, and I told her, 
she said, oh, my husband's a Holocaust survivor. And you know, it was, he just called me this weekend. So we're always making new contacts and looking for new materials. Uh, so you're always welcome to contact me. Uh, you can reach us at curator at ushmm.org. Uh, you can also contact us through a form on our website, which is seen here, www.ushmm.org. Uh, also, if you have not yet done so, we encourage you to become a member of our e-community to receive updates uh, about the programming um, that the museum does. We do programs around the country and internationally as well. Uh, so you can come to one of our events, you can see one of our traveling exhibits, uh, and also I strongly encourage you to visit our website, which is just a wealth of information, and you can also follow us on many different forms of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. I think we're, we're everywhere. We're not on Snapchat, never mind. So, uh, <laughs> but many forms of social media. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for joining us today, both in person and online. And I'm more than happy to take any questions that have come in via Twitter or however they come or within the room, so yes. Dave, can you turn on the microphone, please? I can repeat the questions. That's easier. Do you have any questions in the audience? Sure, when uh, Roger Cohen wrote his book about Berga, mm -hmm. did he come to you as uh, uh, no, Roger Cohen, uh, the question was, uh, when Roger Cohen wrote a very excellent book called From Soldiers to Slaves, I believe the title is. Uh, so the question is, did he come and do research at the museum when he was working on his book? The answer to that is no, because the book was published before I started working on this project and before we acquired the collections. That being said, he did interview a number of Burga survivors, many more who were alive at the time before I started working on this project. Um, his book was written in conjunction with the Charles Guggenheim film that came out around the same time. Uh, and we used it, many of the same collections. So the Vogel family was very generous with their materials and making them available to researchers and scholars uh, prior to their donation at the museum. So a lot of the information he and he used initially has ended up here. And then a lot of it is still either in private hands or at the National Archives and accessible to anybody. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. If you want to learn more. Kara, can you tell us um how many survivors from Burgo there might be alive today? How many of them you've actually in contact with, regardless of whether we've collected anything from them or not? Uh, I've been in touch with about, the question was how many ha are still alive and how many have I been in contact? I think we estimate there's at about five or six GIs that I know for sure are still alive. Um, I know that there's, there may be more out there. Uh, the reason why I say that is the night before, the night that the National Geographic documentary premiered, I had put out on Twitter that the program was airing and I got a response back saying, oh, my grandfather was in Berga, can I call you tomorrow at the museum so we can discuss it? And when I spoke to the gentleman who called, I said, so whatever happened to your grandfather? He kind of dropped off the radar. Um, I didn't have any information on him after the war. And they're actually slight tangent. There was a, um, some of the men, the Burger survivors did receive reparations from Germany. And so I had a list of all the men who got those in 1996. His grandfather's name was not on that list. So I presumed his grandfather had passed away in the years between. And his reply to me was, oh, he's alive and well and living in blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, and I have since spoken with the family in great detail. So uh, again, as far as I know, I would say, what did I say, five or six that I know are, are still alive. Uh, families that I've communicated with, I've probably spoken to about a dozen or so, uh, maybe more. Um, again, some of the men have since passed away since I really started this project in earnest, which is a shame because I have heard nothing but wonderful things about them. I would have loved to have met them. I've seen their oral testimonies. Um, but I have been in touch with a number of the widows and children as well and spoken with them. And you know, we'll see what happens. But again, you never know when someone's going to walk in the door or cold call the museum and say, my uncle was in Berlin. My grandfather was in Berga. Um, people are still, I think it's trickled down, but every now and then we still get new, new inquiries about it. And then people who see the National Geographic program, because it's currently available on Netflix, uh, and 
for everybody also asked, the title of that is Hitler's GI Death Camp. Uh, so if it's still out on Netflix when you're seeing this, you can check it out. Uh, their testimonies are incredible. But people have seen that program and then contacted me saying, I think my my relative was in Burga. Can you confirm this? And I can check it up against the list. So we're still hearing from people, which is nice. And just one quick follow up. These men would have been mostly 18, 19, 20 or so at the time. Yeah, a majority of them uh, were, I would say, 19, 20, 21. These were young guys. And especially when I speak with high school kids or college kids, I did a presentation to a uh, fraternity uh, convention. And I think, oh my God, they're the same age as the audience I'm speaking to are not that much older. Um, I, of course, know them now as, you know, 80, 85, 90 year old men. But to think that they were really just kids when they were going through this, it, it's really mind blowing to think of them that, that young. Do we have any other questions in the audience here? Well, thank you very much, Kara, for a fantastic program. I've thank seen it before. Me. I'm always impressed. So glad to see it again. I'm glad to be able to share it. Hang on, we might have one more thing on the Twitter. Ooh, one more on Twitter. Nope, that's it. Nope, that's it. Okay. Well, you guys can always email us and ask us and find us that way. So thank you. So, just thank you again, Kira. Just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for coming to watch the program here in person. And thank you to everybody who watched us online. We will be, we have recorded this program and we'll be posting it at a later date if you want to watch it again or share it with your family and friends. So thank you very much. <laughs>